Hi John, thanks for joining us on Talking Bull today. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yeah, uh, managing through the lockdown and everything, so we're <laughs> coping. The lockdown we now find ourselves in again. Yeah, um, yeah. So um, let's let's start off just by introducing you to people that are watching that aren't your teammates and don't already know all about John. Okay, well uh, I'm John Coates. I am currently chairman of the the Bulls, and um, I've been a teacher for 16 years. Uh, recently changed to uh, to do project management. And uh, I don't know, I've, I have been called the joker of the team, but I'll try not to. <laughs> now, project management and teaching probably goes hand in hand, I, I yes, imagine, uh, if, if my experience in that sort of industry is anything to go off, just telling people yeah. what to do, really. And... Yeah, pretty much, which is uh, which is all about teaching. So Yeah, it's, and that's the perfect thing for you, telling people what to do. Uh, so, uh, how did you get into wheelchair basketball, and uh, what made you decide to join the Bulls over any other local team? Uh, well, basically, uh, I was shopping um, down in Bury, and I, there was a guy in the wheelchair that I liked the look of, and I was looking for a new wheelchair, so I, I just went over and had a chat. Was it him you liked the look of, or the wheelchair? Uh, the the wheelchair, yeah. <laughs> Just checking. Uh, definitely not him. <laughs> so, uh, and it and it turned out that basically he was um, is the secretary of, uh, of the Bulls, and uh, he mentioned about the, the the training sessions and stuff like that. I hadn't done competitive sport for so long, like since I was about fifteen. Um, and I just liked the sound of it, and it kind of came about in a roundabout way. But it was, uh, yeah, it sounded really interesting. So a few weeks later, I came down to the session, and we didn't scare you away. Uh, it'll take a lot to scare me away. So. <laughs> <laughs> but no, to be honest, when I came down to the session, it was brilliant. I just, um, just having that kind of. Uh, rapport and things that you could build and meet new people. I'm I'm not particularly shy, so that didn't bother me. Um, but everyone was really welcoming and just just kind of you know got picked up and had a bit of banter and just enjoyed it. It was really right. good. And and how long have you been training with the Bulls for and and, and playing? Um, well, I, I think I started training about four years ago. Um, uh, it took me a year to get my skills up and stuff like that to get my first competitive game but the coaching and everything was really good and tailored it to to my specific needs um, because mine is slightly different to a lot of people um, so kind of individual skills and stuff like that and eventually after about a year I, I managed to make my competitive debut so loved it Excellent. What's your favourite thing about playing wheelchair basketball? Uh, well, to be honest, I, I just like the camaraderie and the the kind of, uh, and to be honest, the competitive nature of it as well. Um, I'm, I'm quite, I, I was quite competitive and not playing competitive sport for, for quite a long time. Um, yeah. it, it just kind of re reintroduced that back into my life and, and I was really grateful for it basically so for you it's a mixture of the social side and and the competitive side then yeah basically yeah uh, i just like everything about it i don't think i could uh, <laughs> i could put something specifically favorite but yeah excellent so you mentioned when you when you first started training it took a little while to to get up to speed uh and you mentioned obviously you got uh, some certain needs that are different to other people training yeah. um would you like to just explain a bit more about what your what your classification is and how it affects your ability to play wheelchair basketball? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've got a disability called Charcot-Marie disease, which is quite quite rare. And a um, mouthful. And I, yeah, yeah. We abbreviate it to CMT if that helps. Uh, but, <laughs> but basically, uh, yeah, it affects my extremities and and my ability to do fine motor skills and. I, I do use a wheelchair all the time um, when I'm out of the house. Uh, and yeah, it, it kind of, the, the fine motor skills was a bit of the 
the thing that I thought might hinder me to actually start playing basketball. Um, but once, you know, yourself and, and Tommy had, had thought about it and got a, got a way of getting around it, um, it, it didn't hinder me at all. It's a really inclusive sport. So um, the fact that I'm a one-pointer as well, which is the lowest grading, um, kind of uh, adds a, a bit of uh, flexibility for the teams that you can put out as well. Absolutely. Uh, and just for those that aren't familiar with that particular disability, is it something you were born with or is it something that's sort of developed over time? Uh, yeah, basically nobody in my family has it at all. It was just a, a free mutation. Um, but I've had it since I was born. It's a degenerative condition, so it does get worse over time. Um, so only really the last kind of 10 years I've been using a wheelchair um, permanently. Uh, but yeah, it's, it is what it is, and being able to get back into sport and, and, and being able to basically say the make out of everyone here, uh, training is brilliant, and basically, I'm, I'm the voice on court. So, very loud voice at that. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned it's. You mentioned it's you getting back into sport. So were you able to play basketball or other sports when you were a child, or? Yeah, basically up until the age of 15, really. Um, so when puberty kicks in, I mean, I, I was walking differently and I was doing that, but I could, um, I could, I could run around in, in my own fashion. I played football. I was a goalkeeper. Uh, I played cricket. I was a wicketkeeper batsman. Played basketball, um, badminton. I um, come from a really sporting family, and as I said. Uh, I'm the first one with a disability, so it, so I've, I've kind of played sport just because that was what my family does. <laughs> and and after the age of fifteen, was there a particular reason for not pursuing and some form of adapted sport? Or was it just a case of you didn't know what was around? There was no support for that kind of thing then? Yeah, that, that's exactly it. I mean, um, when I was growing up, there was very little kind of support for disabilities and things like that. Um, and I, I just wasn't aware of anything going on. So I kind of just said, well, I've had the opportunity to do it. So uh, at least I've had that. I'll, I'll just not play. <laughs> well, your uh, your profile on our website does say that uh, wheelchair basketball has given you a new new lease of life, in, in your words. Yeah, absolutely, it definitely has. Um, just just the the kind of, I mean, a lot of my mates would say I just borrow them and talk about basketball all the time, but um, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> no, it, it's it's great, and some of my mates have been down. My parents have been down to watch matches and things like that. It's great. It just gives. Uh, gives a new a new perspective on things and obviously having that kind of the the people to talk to that have experienced similar things all right not the same thing but similar things kind of gives gives you a different perspective and you can get advice you can you can kind of um just talk to people about what's going on that you know have been through a similar thing Absolutely. And you mentioned there about friends and family coming to watch, even at our level, which is which is amateur. It's nowhere near the, the Paralympic level. There is yeah, no, perfect. for me, no greater feeling. You, I asked you what your favourite part of wheelchair basketball was. For me, it's both as a player and a coach, seeing friends and family cheering people on that they've yeah. come to watch yeah. and seeing them score, seeing them play well. It's just great to see. Yeah, yeah. So in terms good, of, I mean, I, I don't do much of the playing well and scoring, but you know, there you go. <laughs> it's a team game. There's no iron team. <laughs> so in terms of uh, your your off court activities with the Bulls, uh, you mentioned at the start yeah. that you're uh, the chairman of the the club and the charity. Uh, yeah. How long have you been doing that for? Uh, well, basically, I came to training, and um, we, we, you were kind of looking for a new chairman, and after after about a year. Uh, the chairmanship came up and I put myself forward and got pretty much unanimously voted in, uh, which which I was really proud of. And it, it, it just kind of allowed me to have that, that different kind of 
aspect of fundraising and overseeing what's going on and managing funds and things like that, which again uses my skills as a teacher um, and and kind of allows a different insight into how the club runs and what goes on with it. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've been working closer with you as treasurer and trying to get different fundraising uh, opportunities off the ground, shall we say, um, sponsorship, things like that. So uh, I know firsthand how, how much work you've put in uh, and not least as a trustee in general and trying to get our training sessions back, which we'll, we'll come on to in a, in a few minutes. Um, but just, just keeping on the subject of wheelchair basketball in general, um, We've seen not been in the sport too long, but you might be aware of you know some top level uh, wheelchair basketball players or just disability sport athletes in general. Yeah. Are there any that you particularly look up to or feel inspired by at all? Well, a lot of it is I've I've just seen the increased coverage of of the kind of disability sports in general. So the Paralympics being on Channel Four and the the GB games being streamed and things. So, um, I, like I said, I wasn't really aware of it, but I've, mm. any opportunity I've had, I've, I've kind of looked at the GB team and I've seen both the men and the women's. Um, and they, yeah, it's just, it's inspirational, really. Uh, obviously, I'm never going to get to that level, but it is good to see people are able to do that. And the fact that, even if you're able-bodied, you've still got access to, to seeing that sport. So really, the, it's just the, the kind of GB team that I look up to. Um, not that I want to be there, you know, just just that it's kind of that, that level and, and the level that people can get to is amazing. I'm going to digress a little bit, but in terms of not getting there, it, whether as a player or not, you, there's always the opportunity to go down a different route to get there, such as coaching or another part of the, the backroom team. So the GB isn't just the players. Uh, so yeah. I think it's the whole setup that's been particularly inspiring in what they've done over the last few years, the, the both on court and off the court. Uh, they've, they've raised quite a lot of awareness and be, Channel 4 has been a bit of a game changer as well with uh, having things like the last leg um, closely following the Paralympics yeah. Uh, yeah. a couple of years ago. So I, th I, I agree. I think the whole uh, increased coverage uh, has, been, has been great for wheelchair basketball and disability sport in general. Yes, yeah, definitely. It's, uh, it's certainly changed in the last few years from what I've seen. So. Yeah, absolutely. So just coming back to the you know, our return to training. Um, obviously, we had the, the coronavirus pandemic lockdown earlier this year. Uh, we seem to find ourselves potentially crawling back towards another one. Um, but at the minute, we are technically still allowed to do some form of limited training. But how, how, did, the, how did you find the, the period of time where we were completely unable to train, which was from around mid-March until the end of July? I found it difficult to be honest because you you're so used to training with people once a week and keeping your fitness up and managing to to have that social interaction action and keep your uh, mental health where it should be. Um, I found it difficult, um, but obviously being part of the team that that kind of put together the training sessions around the COVID government guidelines and things like that. That's quite fulfilling to to know that we can put some form of training in place because mental health is a big issue around disability. Absolutely, and it is refreshing that the government have put that exception in place to allow disability sports to continue, and, and acknowledging that there is that increased uh, you know risk for isolation with people with disabilities not being able to access competitive sport yeah. or even recreational I, I sport. I think it took a while to kind of realise that that was the case, but one, once the advisors had, had come up with that, then yeah, very, very refreshing to, to see that. Absolutely. I mentioned uh, our efforts as trustees and a committee to uh, putting our return to training uh, policies and plans in place. Um, do you want to just talk a little bit more about your involvement with that? 
Um, yeah, well, basically the committee, what, what we uh, what we wanted to do is kind of be pioneers in, in being able to return to training. Um, with us not being affiliated with BWP, we didn't necessarily have to follow their guidelines. Um, and I think actually we, we kind of came out ahead of BWP and uh, managed to put our training plans together. And um, it started off, well, it still is 100% socially distanced and within government guidelines. Um, as a committee, we put our heads together and tried to thrash out any potential problems and any kind of issues that have come with training, sharing balls, things like that. So a lot of our training is fitness based, but the point is that you're still together with your teammates, even though you are further away than you normally would be. Absolutely. And from the angle of coaching, it's been very challenging to say the least, trying to put <laughs> sessions together where yeah. the focus is on the individual rather than the team, which yeah. you would, you know, you would do that during the season. You, you would be trying to focus on individual uh, skill improvements, etc., and trying to, you know, really help out individual with their skills yeah. and things like that. But right now that's all we can do. <laughs> all we can yeah. do is individual skills and individual fitness. There's no <laughs> team games. There's no technical things working on set yeah. plays or yeah. anything like that because we mm. just can't get within two meters of each other. Um, I do think though that um, the, uh, taking the opportunity to actually for new players getting to know the rules and getting to know the the actual game and the technical ins and outs of it and I think that's useful as well because mainly training has been focused on set plays and scrimmaging and things like that which is great um, but kind of the assumption that people knew the rules and knew what was going on um, it is possibly a weakness of, of certainly mine as a coach um, and, and you know of, of the club and other clubs in general. Um, so taking that time to actually get to know the rules and what is a foul, things like that, is, is useful. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a focus of our sessions moving forwards and trying to, trying to find that extra time. We, another thing that we're doing in these training sessions, of course, is making sure that all the equipment that we store at the sports centre is uh, cleaned before and after use with a antiviral spray. So as coach, that is my responsibility to be the only person that does, in fact, come into contact with other people's equipment. Obviously, yeah. I do it in a yeah. safer way possible to protect myself um, with gloves and masks, etc. Um, but you know, we we have to clean it afterwards as well, just just to yeah. you know, yeah. we, we've got to keep the sports centre staff uh, safe as well. So with the way that we store our chairs, in theory, they could come into contact with them, move them around the, the storage cupboard, etc. Yeah. So yeah. we have to keep a lot of things yeah. in there, mind. It's there not there just our players. Of, a lot of avenues that need to be covered, really. And that was the beauty of having the, the whole committee to do it. Nothing was missed, hopefully. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and we have a, we've, we've had good feedback from other clubs about the return to training and things like that which is which is really useful feedback and nice to hear absolutely and i think a lot of clubs are, are still having to follow the bwb's guidance which is completely understandable um as members because without doing you know without doing that you you risk voiding your insurance that you get as a member um, whereas we've got our own insurance as a club and uh, i don't think our plan is drastically simple uh, too far away from uh, BWB's plan at all, really. Uh, when you look into the detail of what they're proposing, they've just started off with um, outdoor training, which we did look at, um, but we, we decided that it was too difficult, certainly as we approached the winter, to find something suitable, not least with the weather coming into it and you know, training in the cold, um, but also yeah. finding a surface that was suitable for uh, for wheelchairs we looked at industrial units but unfortunately the local councils were saying that those units were not uh, you know the businesses that own those units weren't uh, set up for doing sports as being a part of their licensing and council stuff so yeah we couldn't yeah. use those facilities we have to use actual sporting facilities so finding an outdoor court with the right surface to be kind on the wheelchairs is difficult 
yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. Um, not to mention the fact that certain people, myself included, find it difficult to push on a tarmac surface or something like that because of the uh, the way disabilities can affect you. So. Absolutely, and then you've got the the other issues to think about, such as uh, you know finding access to to cleaning, you know washing your hands. It's, it's a government um, government yeah. guidance is to keep washing your hands regularly, sanitizing your hands, etc. An outdoor court, you don't have those options available. Um, you, you've got to think about things like parking. It, how close can you get uh, disability parking to an outdoor court? depends on the facilities available and for us we just couldn't find one and um with all the steps that we've put in place to make sure all the equipment's cleaned that everyone's staying at least two meters away i mean in fact we calculated that we should be able to keep at least five meters away with the with our limit of uh, 16 people we've not come close to 16 people yet i think the highest was 11 including one uh person that had come along um within their bubble um so you know, we, we've not come close to that, and um, yeah. even even with the the ten that were taking part in the in the session, we were able to keep more than two meters away. So it's it's gone really well. Um, we had to have a little break just for um, well, my daughter was sent home to to isolate from school. Um, the rules didn't really mean that I had to, which are a little bit confusing, yeah. but let's not go on to politics. Um, but just as a precaution, even though there were no symptoms, we, we decided yeah. better safe than sorry, we'll, uh, we'll suspend for two yeah. weeks. But well, to be honest, there's, there's and... that, but there'd be nothing worse than, than a case of COVID coming and us knowing that we could have actually done more to prevent that. So we're definitely erring on the side of caution in, in that respect yeah absolutely i mean the plan has always been written in a way that means that if somebody does come in with it it doesn't spread because ultimately (laughs) especially with it being possible to carry the virus asymptomatically we can't guarantee that nobody's going to come in with the virus we just can't do that there's always going to be that risk potentially a low risk but there is always going to be that risk but what we can do is make sure that with all the steps we put in place in line with the government's recreational sport framework, it doesn't spread or you know, the yeah. best we can possibly do. And uh, if, if we ever find ourselves in that unfortunate situation, you know, we can just, we'll have to just revisit that plan and, and see what we could have done better. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, it's, it's definitely not going to be perfect, um, but so far so good. I think, uh, I think it's going well. And yeah. uh, everyone's enjoying being back to doing some form of exercise because for a lot of people, oh, yeah. the, the feedback we've had from members has been uh, has been really good. That they've been able to to get back to training and some sort of normality. All right, it's altered, but you've you've got that kind of outlet once a week of being able to to train and do something physical. So yeah, absolutely. Right, I think it's time we move on to the more fun bit. Um, we're going to have a little joke competition. So we're both dads. We both tell terrible dad jokes. Uh, <laughs> time to find out who's got the worst ones and can make the other one laugh. So the way we're going to run it is we've got 10 jokes each. I'll let you start first and we'll alternate. And oh, that's fun with you. <laughs> try and keep a straight face. And if okay. you don't, then... Uh, well, sorry, if I'm telling you a joke and you don't keep a straight face, I get a point and we'll see who wins at the end of it. All right, let's see how this goes. Okay, then, so joke off. Dad joke number one. Why can't you have a nose that's 12 inches long? I don't know. Because it would then be a foot. It would. No reaction there. Mate. <laughs> Here's mine. So, my friend David, he lost his ID recently. So now I just call him Dav. No, I'm not getting one there, am I? No, just a shake of the head. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Have you heard the rumor about going around? Yeah, sorry. Have you heard the rumor going around about butter? Uh, no, I haven't. No, never mind. I shouldn't spread it. No. No laughs there, mate. Sorry. 
So, I was recently accused of enjoying jokes about criminal trials. Guilty as charged. Yeah, you got a bit of a grin there. I'll give you that one. <laughs> there we go. I'll have a point. I'll have a point. <laughs> okay, want to hear a joke about construction? Yeah, I'm please do. working on it. Uh, you've got one there. You've got one. You've got one. I'll let you have that one. Oh, okay. You shouldn't have laughed at that. No, I really shouldn't. It was. Uh, <laughs> I think I was expecting a different thing, and then yeah, you yeah, just got you yeah. caught me. You caught me. <laughs> <sighs> okay, number three. Then I woke up this morning and I forgot which side the sun rises from, and then it dawned on me. That's He's fighting cold. it. He's fighting That's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. That's just for <laughs> my natural. Uh, my natural look is smiling, so I've got to try and avoid that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. My my joke then. Uh, did you hear about the restaurant on the moon? No. Uh, great food, but no atmosphere. Oh, I'll avoid it then. I would. Next one then. There's a fine line. You'll know this as a, as a math teacher. There's a fine line between a numerator and a denominator, but only a fraction of people will get that joke. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to concede I've heard that one before, so I'll, I'll have to fight <sighs> that one. <laughs> oh, that one might get you. <laughs> okay, so what did the buffalo say to her son when he left for school? I don't know. Bye, son. Yeah, heard that one before, I'm afraid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did you know that you can never hear a psychiatrist using the bathroom? The pee is silent. <laughs> I'll give you that one. <laughs> Boom. Got one. Oh, I've got an actual laugh there. Gonna, gonna actually use that one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, did you hear about the guy who invented the not not joke? No. He won the Nobel Prize. Definitely keeping a straight face on that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, some people say that they pick their nose. I was just born with mine. Definitely a dad joke, that one. That's definitely a dad joke, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, how, how do you find Will Smith in the snow? I don't know. Follow the fr fresh prints. So if, if you I hadn't Google, stumbled Google there, I think. Better, you might have had a laugh. <laughs> yeah, it's all in the delivery. Yeah, I know, yeah. Which I'm not great at, but hey. <laughs> so if you witness a crime at an Apple store, does that make you an eyewitness? No, I've been not. No. No. No, no. no laugh there. <laughs> okay. Did you know that the first French fries weren't really cooked in France? Did they not? They were, no, they were cooked in Greece. Uh, makes sense. I'd love to tell you a joke about a margarita pizza, but it's too cheesy. Yeah, you're not going to laugh at that one, mate. I thought I'd get one there. I thought I'd get one. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is ET short for? Go on. Because he's only got little legs. He has. <laughs> Come on, you you got. Yeah, a you've got a that. little grin there. You've got oh, a little grin. I've heard it before, but it's a classic. <laughs> Oh, damn it. That's 2-2 two, two by my maths. It says, yeah. Quick maths. The, did you hear that the World Tongue Twister champion got, just got arrested? I hear no, they're I giving didn't. him a really tough sentence. No, I could have oh, that he's one. not correct. No, he's correct. Oh, no, it's no. the last one each. Okay, so... 
I've always had an irrational fear of speed bumps, but don't worry, I'm slowly getting over it. <laughs> you got one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can't believe that one got me. Uh, I think you've broken me down. <laughs> oh, no. Right, last but not least. As you know, I always look out for fundraising opportunities for the Bulls. And uh, recently I thought about organising a, a hide-and-seek competition. But good players are just so hard to find. No, not having that one. Oh. Victory! <laughs> God damn it. Oh, I'll, I'll let you have that one. I'll let you have that I one. I knew this speed bump joke could get you. I knew it yeah. saved it for last. Oh. I'm going to have to up my game for the next one. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is it Steve next? Yeah, it's going to be Steve next. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll make sure to, to let him know that you, uh, you like the look of him in the supermarket. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yep. <laughs> right. Well, thanks for joining us, John. And uh, no, no I will uh, no doubt see you soon, mate. Yeah, definitely. Take care. You too. Thank you. See ya.